Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Scott Kilpatrick, uh, Director of Orthopedic Pathology Subspecialty Service and the Co-Director for the Center for E-Pathology at the Cleveland Clinic. Today I'd like to talk to you about Ewing sarcoma and similar undifferentiated round cell sarcomas. I'd like to provide you with a historical aspect and detail what the current WHO updates are regarding this particular group of tumors. So let's just start by showing you some differences between the fourth edition of the WHO on bone and soft tissue tumors and the updated fifth edition uh, on this particular topic. And you can see right away there's been some differences in the categorization. First of all, um, we no longer have this Ewing-like sarcoma category. Instead, simply we have Ewing sarcomas. And in the undifferentiated category, we used to have pleomorphic sarcomas and the small round cells, which really was principally the CIC rearranged. But now we've proliferated into around cell sarcomas with EWSR1 and non-ETS fusions, the CIC rearranged sarcoma, and the sarcomas with B-core genetic alteration. So we're gonna go through those in detail and try to answer the question of why we have developed this classification and why we've evolved to this uh, subclassification. So historically, it may come as a surprise to you to know that the diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma was actually established quite a long time ago. Over 100 years ago, we really began to to understand that there was a small round cell uh, sarcoma that bared uh, Dr. James Ewing's name. Um, also, ironically, prior to his discovery of Ewing sarcoma, Stout described uh, what later became known as primitive neuroectodermal tumor, and at least in, in my lifetime, uh, Dr. Fred Askin described a similar round cell Ewing-like sarcoma, but principally arising in the chest wall and the thoracopulmonary region in children with, that also appeared to be fairly aggressive. Although for many years people suspected these were probably a spectrum of the same neoplasm, it really was in the 1980s when we were able to successfully karyotype these that that was proven without a shade of doubt. Uh, and that is we, we eventually were able to show, uh, initially through letters to the New England Journal of Medicine in 1983 that documented the 1122 translocation in Ewing's to ultimately the same translocation being present in PNET and Askin's tumor. All that being said, there were still a subset of cases that were being put in these various categories that did not share this translocation. Thus led to a proliferation of studies looking at these round cells sarcomas that identified a wide range of molecular abnormalities, some of these lesions being quite rare. We're gonna talk about this in a little more detail later on, uh, but this is what occurred over the last few decades and as we begin to better define this particular group of tumors. Um, in my own attempts to better understand this, I wrote a review article in Advances in Anatomic Pathology that we're going to circle back to, particularly this particular table, which I think will summarize the current categorization quite well. So Ewing sarcoma has gone from being a tumor that was described uh, solely by James Ewing's in 1921 to be a tumor that is now molecularly defined. And that is, we define Ewing sarcoma as being characterized by gene fusions between the TET family of RNA binding proteins, and that includes EWSR1, and very rarely the FUS gene, which you'll learn can act sort of interchangeably, with a specific family of genes called the E26 transformation specific, or we'll call that collectively the ETS family of genes. It includes FLY1, ERG, ETV1, ETV4, and FEV. When we take that into consideration, that we have demographics, and those demographics are largely that these tumors are usually teenagers, young adults, five to 25 years of age, extremely rare in infancy, males more common in females, more common in Caucasians, uh, more common as a primary bone tumor uh, than that seen in bone, although extra osseous sites can occur as well. And when it involves the bone, these are typically the shafts of the long bones, the diaphyseal regions, the pelvis and the ribs, although virtually any bone can be afflicted by Ewing sarcoma. Over here in the top right-hand corner, you see the classic features of Ewing sarcoma, a round cell sarcoma, very little to any atypia, and very little to any stromas associated with this. And when we use that hallmark marker CD99, as we see over here on the right side, the diffuse membranous positivity really defines this particular lesion. It sort of begs the question, can you make the diagnosis of Ewing sarcoma today without molecular? Uh, I used to say yes, 
if it provided it fit very stringent demographic uh, features and I had the CD99 positivity coupled with negativity for example for TDT and other lymphoid markers um, but I've sort of evolved now because most of the treatment that's involving these at least at this institution uh, there's interest in knowing the partner of the gene and confirming it so I've tended to, to err on the side of confirming all these at molecular and only in those circumstances where the specimen may have been heavily decalcified and that's not an option will I attempt to render this diagnosis without molecular confirmation. It goes without saying that the spectrum viewing sarcoma also includes what Stout originally described as primitive neurectodermal tumor, and that is, of course, the presence of rosettes. There was always a question of how many rosettes you needed for a Ewing sarcoma to be a primitive neurectodermal tumor. We know now it doesn't matter. They're all the same tumor, but this within the spectrum is, is of course, perfectly acceptable for the diagnosis. I show you this because really beyond this type of spectrum, Anything else, whether it's a more significantly more atypia or stroma, particularly if it's myxoid or spindling of the tumor cells, any of these other features should make you think about a non-Ewing round cell type of sarcoma. And that leads us into the next category, round cell sarcomas with EWSR1 non-ETS fusions. And of course, we say EWSR1, but this also includes the FUS gene. These include genes like NFATC2, which is the most common in this category, and PATS1, for example. Uh, very extraordinarily rare tumors. And these tumors tend to have a more heterogeneous features than what we saw with Ewing sarcoma. And you see that, of course, with the round cell population here, the more spindly cells that sort of have these anastomosing strands type picture, and the very prominent myxohyalinized stroma that often makes up this subset of tumors. These features would not be seen in Ewing sarcoma. And so it's finding these, as I've mentioned before, should suggest a different diagnosis. Now among the tumors that fall in this family, the one we know the most about, at least over the last decade, are those that involve the NFATC2. We know there's a wide age range that occurs with these from children to adults. We know that bone is more commonly involved in soft tissue, males more than females, but again, very distinctive myxohyaline stroma around the spindle cells. And CD99 is often patchy and actually may be negative. Outcome data is still somewhat limited in these tumors, but they do appear to be uh, aggressive, probably more aggressive than classic Ewing sarcoma. And again, you have to think about this diagnosis because sometimes with these, uh, with the round cell sarcomas with the EWSR1 non-ETS fusions, it will be unclear that it's even a round cell sarcoma. I've seen one example that was misdiagnosed as a chondromyxoid fibroma, and it wasn't uh, recognized until the local recurrence occurred. So the CIC or chick rearranged sarcomas are the most common sarcomas in the group of non-EWSR1 Ewing-like sarcomas. It involves a fusion between chromosome 19, the CIC gene, and the DUX4 double home box gene at either chromosome 4 or its analog at DUX4L at chromosome 10. The result is a very aggressive tumor. First of all, you can see the morphology of this tumor is distinctly different, right? I mean, over here, this little bit higher power view, you've got fairly atypical cells. It exceeds what we should generally see in Ewing sarcoma. Some of these have prominent nucleoli, but there's a significant amount of cytologic variation. And over here, you see a little bit of a myxoid stroma. You can see spindling in these tumor cells as well. And sort of a recurrent theme is you don't get that nice CD99 membranous diffuse positivity of Ewing's. Instead, what you see is a patchy and blotchy uh, positivity, sometimes even negative. Frequently, you'll also see WT1 cytoplasmic staining, but one antibody that I particularly like for this is DUX4. We found this to be extremely sensitive and specific at the Cleveland Clinic, and I'll even render this diagnosis now based solely on the staining of this immunostain. It just, this diffuse nuclear positivity is very characteristic in the appropriate clinical context. Important tumor to recognize, typically young adults more common in soft tissue than in bone, particularly around the, the trunk and extremities. And you can see bones only involved in about 3% of cases, 
but so it tends to behave very aggressively, responds very poorly to chemotherapy regimens. So Ewing sarcoma chemotherapy is not generally very effective in this, so important tumor to recognize from a prognostic standpoint. One of the more rare tumors are the round cell sarcomas with the B-core genetic alterations. We've come to understand that B-core genetic alterations encompass a wide range of uh, other sarcomas, some of which are completely unrelated to the round cell group. But for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to focus on those that are uh, 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 more, more likely to mimic Ewing sarcomas, and that typically involves this BCL6 co-repressor round cell sarcoma uh, fusion involving the cyclin B3 CC and B3 gene, both genes located on the X chromosome. Interestingly, despite the fact that this is a completely separate genetic alteration, the demographics for this tumor are remarkably similar to that of classic Ewing's. These are usually teenagers, young adults, mean age 15 years, males more common than females, bone uh, origin more common than soft tissue origin, long bones being a good site for this. You can see in the MRI here, this changes in signal intensity over here, and even so evidence of soft tissue extension. Again, you saw this, you wouldn't be able to distinguish this from Ewing's sarcoma. Um, but again, the morphology and the immunophenotype is different. Yes, you have the round cells that you see here, but you also have areas of myxoid stroma. You have a little bit more tendency towards spindling down here. The CD99 positivity is variable, sometimes negative, but you get positivity of some other interesting markers, uh, principally TLE1, cyclin D1, and SATB2. And I find SATB2 to be somewhat interesting because of, of the fact that there have been a few examples of B core rearranged sarcomas that produce bone. And this has made me wonder whether small cell osteosarcoma is a real entity or not, or whether a subset of those actually represent B-core rearranged sarcomas. Unlike the chick ducks or the chicks rearranged sarcomas, the outcome data here is somewhat similar to classic Ewing sarcomas, and these tumors respond very well to the Ewing sarcoma chemotherapy regimens. So coming back to this uh, summary paper here, I want to just highlight uh, these two regions here because this kind of summarizes what we now really think of as Ewing sarcoma and ETS gene fusions with the EWSR1 being the most common and the FUS being the less common uh, ones associated with this. And taking this a step further, here are the round cell sarcomas with the non-ETS gene fusion, which I think are probably a more heterogeneous group. At least some of these may end up being not round cell sarcomas at all, but for example, could represent uh, a spectrum of the myoepithelial carcinomas. Now, lastly, just leave you with this note. I mentioned earlier that for the most part, I confirm the diagnosis of a Ewing's uh, with molecular confirmation. But that usually includes next generation sequencing. Uh, again, if I'm limited and I only have fish as a choice, I'll use, I'll use fish. But it's becoming more and more apparent just how promiscuous the EWSR1 gene is. And this table just shows you some examples of non-round cell sarcomas, like clear cell sarcoma or myopathelioma or exoskeletal myxoid chondrosarc, subsets of myxoid round cell sar liposarcomas that can have this EWSR1 gene fusion that have morphologies and, and immunophenotypes completely different from what we saw in the round cell sarcoma. So getting the EWSR1 fish is okay, but just remember that when you use it, you need to have a fairly limited differential. It won't be useful in cases in which you have no idea what the tumor actually represents. I'm tending to use next generation sequencing now for cases in which I'm trying to confirm or exclude this group of tumors. And I wanna thank you for giving me your time.